Good morning. morning. It's good to see you. I'm glad that we can worship our great God uh, together this morning. And our Lord calls us to worship this morning with Psalm 115. So I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God. Go to God in prayer. And our great and almighty God, we do give you praise and thanks. We thank you and praise you, O God, for your great love with which you have loved us. That we praise you uh, that in your love uh, that you have sent your Son, that he has died, that we might live. And in your love you have poured forth your Spirit, uh, that we might know you and uh, live our lives with you in full communion with you. We thank you, God, that you gather us together as the body of Christ, that we might uh, sing your praises, that together here we anticipate that eternal uh, day when we will love you and we will sing in wonder and praise of your almighty uh, power and name. We pray, O God, that you would now sanctify our worship of you. Uh, Would you get all the glory, O God? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, This morning, I invite you to join uh, with me and the church through the ages, uh, confessing uh, our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I ask you, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let's now go before God's throne of grace and corporately confess our sins together using uh, the prayer of confession found in your order of service. Let's pray together. Most holy and merciful Father, we acknowledge and confess before you our sinful nature, prone to evil and slothful in good, and all our shortcomings and offenses. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us who are ashamed and sorry for everything in which we have displeased you. Teach us to hate our errors, cleanse us from our secret faults, and forgive our sins for the sake of your dear Son. And, O oh, most holy and loving Father, help us to live in your light and walk in your ways according to the commandments of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear now these words of assurance of pardon that come from the prophet Micah. Who is like you? Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Uh, this prophecy of Micah was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ who has plunged our sins deep into the sea. And we have the assurance of our pardon then in God's unchangeable word and promise and the fulfillment of it in Christ our Lord. As a response then to this assurance that we have in Christ himself, I invite you to stand as we sing our uh, next hymn, hymn 481, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Please stand as we sing.
Please be seated. I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 42 for our first scripture reading this morning. Isaiah chapter 42, we will read uh, verses 10 through 17, and you can find this on page 102 in the Blue Church Bible in front of you. In verses 1 through 9 of, of uh, chapter 42 of Isaiah's uh, prophecy, uh, we heard of a new thing uh, that was happening through a servant of the Lord. And now in response to this new thing, a new song is called for in these verses here. This song is a, uh, a song that is uh, for the whole world. Uh, to consider, we see in verses 10 through 12 that uh, all of the area around where Israel uh, would be, from the coastlands uh, all the way through, are invited to sing this new song along with God's uh, people, Israel. The song is, as we see in verse 13, a song uh, about the Lord's action, uh, that as he uh, rouses himself in a work of salvation. And then in verses 14 through 17, comment on uh, the effects of this work, this active work of the Lord. Uh, we see a, a, a number of contrasts here, whereas he was quiet, now he is loud. And now he rouses himself to work uh, loudly and boldly and noticeably, uh, whereas there are places that should be uh, filled with water, when he acts, they will be uh, dried up. Uh, those who are blind are, are led certainly and securely. And those who might think they have great trust in idols uh, are, in fact, put uh, to shame. A study in contrasts in the work of the Lord as he uh, rouses himself to uh, act. Uh, one that is a song, then, is, that is meant for the whole world to sing to the glory of God. So give you attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Uh, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 10 through 17. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, he shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. The word of the Lord. As we continue to worship in response to this song, I invite you, uh, I invite the ushers forward as we continue to worship with the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you a great praise uh, that you have uh, roused to action and uh, you have uh, most especially and most clearly through the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, revealed yourself uh, to us, that we would uh, know you as our God who saves. Now in response uh, to uh, who you are and how you have worked for us and for our salvation, we give you these tithes and these offerings, and we pray, O oh God, that you would use them powerfully, uh, that the whole world uh, would indeed join in the new song of uh, glory to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Would you join me for our prayer of intercession this morning? As you know, it's our custom to use a psalm as we, to guide us in these prayers. And our psalm this morning is Psalm 142. It is on page 523 in the Bible that is under the chair in front of you. Again, Psalm 142 on page 523 in the Pew Bible. The psalm is titled, You Are My Refuge. It's a mascal, which means to impart wisdom. So David is here providing a window into his soul, his complete faith and showing us his complete faith in God and giving instruction for our benefit. Beginning at verse 1. With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. Pour out my, I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. Heavenly Father, as David showed his complete trust in you by pouring out his heart to you and trusting you to answer his prayers, so we freely pour out our hearts to you. We confess that while we sometimes endure trouble or circumstances that overwhelm us, we know you are there and understand our complaints and our troubles. When we feel alone or, all, or that all ignore or forsake us, we ask that you help us to realize that you care. You understand our deepest loneliness and sorrow. Jesus has experienced loneliness and abandonment by his friends, but never by you. And he lives today to intercede for us at your right hand. We pray for those around the world who are suffering, dear Lord, and experiencing violence and derision for their faith in you. Have mercy on them, we pray, and bless them. May we recognize their lives as instructive as we see increasing hatred of Christ and Christ followers, even in our own land. We pray for those who are experiencing the devastation of war and hatred unfounded on anything but the sinful desires of men for power or for hatred of you and those who claim faith in you. May many be spared and come to true faith and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. We know it is you who protects us from evil and from the evil one, even providing caves in which we can safely hide as David did. With the psalmist we pray, I cry to you, O Lord, I say you are my refuge my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they too are too strong for me. Bring me out of my prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. And Father, we are confident that you hear our prayers and that you will surround us with your love and that you will ultimately deliver us from all evil. But while we remain here on this earth, we ask that you provide for the needs of each of your children, for education, for employment, for food and shelter and everyday needs. Provide wise and skilled care for those who are in need of medical attention. Sustain and grow the health and strength of your church and extend ministries of the word to the innermost parts of our families, our communities, and to the outermost parts of the earth. Have mercy on our nation as it seems there is an intent on bringing about radical change, removing all acknowledgement of the truth of the Christian gospel 
and replacing values once based on your word with rebellion against the very facts of creation. Work in the lives of those in positions of authority and lead them in order that we might, in your sovereign plan, provide us with the ability to, leave, to live peaceable lives, able to worship you and share your gospel with others. And we pray that your spirit would sustain us and equip us to be bold messengers of your gospel. When we are brought low, we ask that you help us to look up. You, O oh God, are our refuge. We thank you and praise your holy name. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. This morning as we continue uh, to work through John's gospel in our sermon series, uh, we come to verses 24 to 31, which you can find on page 907. Blue Church Bibles. Uh, here we, we move to this second uh, post-resurrection appearance of our Lord to his uh, disciples, um, this one uh, now with Thomas, uh, this, this one uh, advancing what we saw uh, last week, uh, reminding us of the blessing it is uh, to have uh, the testimony, the eyewitness testimony uh, that the Lord is risen. We give your attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word, John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his, in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? And blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which, we are, which, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for these words, and we uh, pray that you uh, would help us as we believe, that you would help us uh, in our unbelief and strengthen us and encourage us, that we would uh, see Christ all the more clearly uh, through your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I generally find it the opposite of helpful uh, to Google a phrase to find out what the internet thinks about something. So against my best judgment, I Googled, have a blessed day, just to see what, what would come up. This is what I found. I found a discussion on whether it's appropriate to use this phrase in an, uh, in an office setting, and surprisingly, may, or maybe not surprisingly, the, options were, or the, the opinions were mixed about whether or not you could say, have a blessed day at work. I found an article about a woman who was hit by a two-by-two two after she said, have a blessed day. Not because she said, have a blessed day. Correlation causation here. Nevertheless, it came up. <clears throat> and then there were the, the typical feel-good stories about random acts of kindness, and they always included this phrase, have a blessed day. So what did I gain from Googling have a blessed day? I gained a renewed appreciation that the world needs Jesus, first of all. Uh, it also reinforced my conviction uh, that I shouldn't Google stuff. And more importantly, 
that true blessedness had better have a firm foundation if it's going to mean anything substantial. Indeed, what does it mean to be blessed? We have uh, the scriptures to tell us, to give us the content of blessedness. And we have in our text a New Testament saying about blessedness. And amazingly, it is in the context of believing, and I would argue believing in the testimony, the eyewitness testimony as it has been delivered to us from the apostles, uh, handed down through the generations in the church, uh, in, in the scriptures, that Jesus is the Christ. That is true blessedness. What does it mean to have a, a blessed day? It means uh, to live uh, in faith that Jesus is Lord and to have life in him. And so, main idea this morning, faith in the risen Lord is a great blessing. Faith in the risen Lord is a great blessing. As we walk through our text this morning, we'll review it through this lens of blessing uh, in three parts. First, blessing missed, then a blessing made up for, and finally the blessing magnified. So missed, made up for, and magnified. Beginning with verses uh, 24 and 25, <coughs> excuse me, we see our first point, uh, the blessing is missed. So look at verse 24. On the heels of the first resurrection appearance of Jesus to his disciples, uh, John tells us to set the context for what comes next, that Thomas, one of the twelve, was not uh, there that first Sunday, Easter Sunday evening. Naturally then, the other disciples, the next time, whenever that was, that they had an opportunity to see Thomas, they told them the coolest thing ever, we have seen the Lord. Obviously, their encounter with the risen Lord was noteworthy, and of all the people that would probably want to know that they had seen the Lord would be Thomas, because Thomas himself had followed Jesus, he had eaten with him, he had learned from him for years. And so they made known their eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We have seen the Lord. But Thomas is not going to have anything to do with their eyewitness testimony. So he responds to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. First of all, what a slap in the face to the other disciples, isn't that? Like, you've got the best news in the world, and you tell your friend who you've, you've lived with and, and eaten with, and you've, you've, you've gone through the trenches, as it were, with, and he's like, no, not interested. I won't see it. I won't believe it until I see it. I mean, they must have been giddy with excitement to tell Thomas that they had seen him, seen the Lord, uh, but Thomas brushes them aside. So what are we to make then of Thomas's statement here? Let me give you just three angles on what's going, what I, as I see it, what's going on here. First of all, Thomas is, is undermining eyewitness testimony. Whether he, whether he intends to or not, he is undermining the value of eyewitness testimony. He's, he's calling into question the credibility of the other disciples as witnesses. Now, Thomas, uh, growing up as he, as he is, I mean, at this point he's still a Jew. He's, he's within the Jewish world mindset, right? Two or more witnesses are sufficient in a court. And he had well more than two, right? Right? And yet he says to them, that's not enough evidence. I need more. He is he's undermining eyewitness testimony in the way that he responds uh, to this report from the other disciples. Uh, secondly, not only is he undermining the eyewitness testimony, but he's elevating uh, what, uh, what he can see, the, the physical reality of, around him as, as more valuable, more real uh, than the report that came from other people. This is not to say that Thomas would literally only accept the other disciples' testimony if he could plunge his hand into Jesus' side. 
We don't have to go that far. Herman Ridabas, as he, he comments on this verse, says that Thomas's statement is undoubtedly not intended to lay down a serious condition for belief, but to expose the absurdity of what they tell him. I mean, dead men don't rise from the dead. That's the absurdity as far as he's concerned. Thomas rejects as impossible the whole idea of the miracle of which his fellow disciples are talking about. And so it's not that he has to, in order to see in order to believe, he has to be able to s- plunge his hand. Like, this is where we could say at least seeing is believing from that perspective, right? But what is he doing here? Uh, the warrant for belief for Thomas here lies in what his senses can perceive. What his eyes can see, his ear can hear, his hand can touch, these are the things that make something real to him. But that's a very unfair elevation of our senses over against eyewitness testimony. Most of us haven't seen the far-flung reaches of the world, and yet we we still take as true the evidences of people who have gone to some of those places and say, this is what it's like. We don't say, unless I can see those places, you know, and and pull some plants off and, and investigate it myself, I'll never believe it. This is the difference between, you know, flat earther and, and whatever the opposite of that is. Life, reality, right? Unless I can go up in space and see, you know, and, and travel orbit around the earth, I'll never believe it. And well, people have done that. And besides, the, you know, anyway, you get my point. I'm not going down that rabbit hole right now. Third observation. Uh, it's really not about Thomas's sense perception at the end of the day. It's really about Thomas. Right? This is what it comes down to. And Thomas's statement here is highlighting uh, that he is the ultimate arbiter of truth. And that's what he's getting down to. You know, how do I know something is truth? Because I say it's truth. It's really, if we're, we're going to take what he says uh, at its, you know, the extremes of, of what he means, Expanding on this idea that touching the risen Lord is not a serious condition for belief, the point then is that it's not really about his sense perception, uh, but that he is the one who determines what is true and false. Thomas decides how faith in the risen Lord should come about. Only what is convincing to me is a just warrant uh, for faith in the risen Lord. That is really what he's getting, that's what it gets down to here. He's saying, you know, I appreciate that y'all had this, this vision or whatever it might have been, but really I need, I need to really determine whether this actually happens. It's about me. What an impoverished way of about go, going about life, though, is presented here in Thomas's rebuttal of the other disciples. And actually, it, it carries within itself... Uh, its own defeat. It, re- it, it exposes its own insufficiency. Think about Thomas. Again, he's steeped in, in Judaism. If he was the only arbiter of truth, then he would have known the whole truth and would have known that the Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah had to die and be raised. If he trusted his sense perception then he would have known, because his ears had heard it, that Jesus himself had said at least three times, I'm going to die and be raised on the third day. He should have, as we've already mentioned, trusted eyewitness testimony, steeped as he should have been in the Old Testament. Thomas is not enough. He can't be his own final arbiter of truth. His own rejection of the other disciples simply contradicts what he is trying to uh, argue implicitly in how uh, he rejects them. All that to say is that Thomas definitely needs the risen Lord. And also he has totally missed 
a tremendous blessing in the way that he has responded to these other disciples. I mean, think about it from the perspective of the other disciples now. They've got the greatest gift, the greatest blessing that they can deliver to anybody. We have seen the Lord. It is the good news that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And he rejects the gift. He misses the blessing. He misses his own kind of blessing <coughs> as being a prominent, uh, p- the potential of being a prominent follower of Christ who believed without seeing. He missed the blessing that is the good news itself. Now, Thomas, we should all acknowledge, is not alone in missing blessing. He... Uh, Thomas's uh, mindset is not foreign to our current day at all. The world is filled with people who are playing the game of life with the wrong set of rules. Fully believing in their hearts that they can be the arbiter of truth. In a very imbalanced way, uh, accepting only that which the eye can see, the ear can hear denying legitimate eyewitness testimony. It's just helpful to acknowledge this. Just say it out loud. This is what's happening all over the place, even today. But then also it should move us in a way. It is obstinate disbelief. But it's a missed blessing. If you think about it as a missed blessing rather than just, you know, you're being an absolute fool, it does kind of change the way you approach the response. It's a missed blessing. As a very quick takeaway, pray that God would go before us and prepare the hearts of those who would hear this blessing of the good news that they wouldn't miss it. That's, that's a takeaway as we consider how Thomas uh, is, is very much alive. The spirit of Thomas is very much alive today. Pray uh, that many more would go from darkness to light. And indeed, precisely like Thomas does in this text. He was not left in the dark. He was not left... Uh, to be a fool, but rather the missed blessing is made up for. And we see this in verses 26 through 28. Continuing on in verse 26, we we find out the the scene is set again, similar to the one before, but now slightly different. Eight days later, Jesus' disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Uh, This new scene here is a lot like the old scene, isn't it? The disciples are shut up again in a locked room on a Sunday. Thomas, of course, is is with them this time. Uh, But Jesus sovereignly takes his stand among them in spite of the locked doors, and he greets them with that most significant of greetings that we talked about last week, peace be with you. Now, whatever other significance there might be to this, this developing pattern, as it seems, of Christ meeting with his disciples on Sundays, and there are a couple directions we could go with that. The parallelism with his first appearance at least points to Christ's single objective of bringing his disciples to a deeper, a truer faith to him, in him, when they meet with him, or rather I should say when he meets uh, with them. But it shouldn't fail us that he's also meeting them on Sundays. And here we are, uh, meeting with the Lord on a Sunday. Now, for all those, the parallels here between these first two weeks after the resurrection, the first two Sundays after the resurrection, uh, there are also differences. In verse 27, a question uh, uh, should come up in our mind because something interesting happens in verse 27. Jesus appears, then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, 
but believe. And here's the question that should come up in our minds. What shade of red did Thomas's face turn when Jesus appeared and said these words to him? I'm going to go with deep plum. That's, that's the shade of red, something, something very red that would indicate how embarrassed Thomas would have felt when Jesus directed very specifically his comments at Thomas's unbelief. Now, whether he blushed or not, it seems quite reasonable to believe that when Jesus publicly addresses here Thomas's uh, rejection uh, of the other disciples' eyewitness testimony about him, Thomas would have felt ashamed. And we shouldn't be ashamed to call what's happening here a shaming experience for Thomas. Because that's what it is. And there are actually two levels to this shaming experience that we need to appreciate here. <coughs> First of all, Thomas would have been ashamed to realize that Jesus heard his denial of the other disciples. That's the first thing we see with how specific Jesus responds to him. We remember, oh yeah, Jesus is also God. He hears everything. He heard me deny him. That's what the, 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 constant, the implications would have, would have flooded into his mind instantly. Like anybody who says something rash or unkind about a person only to find out that that person is just around the corner and heard everything, Thomas would have felt shame at this realization. You know, I think, uh, somewhat digressing here, so bear with me, but in many ways our society today is shameless, and I wonder if this point actually hits uh, in a general sense. Because in some quarters, rash words have actually turned into a kind of virtue. So, you know, it's like no big deal. He, he said something rash. He shouldn't have said it. But, uh, you know, that's what men do. Problem is that much of that rashness is planned and performative. There are instances, and this is where the hot mic phenomenon is, is helpful for us, where suddenly we realize that there still is a little bit of that shame uh, when you cut through all the junk. Precisely, precisely because the hot mic comments always elicit a response. If you, didn't fe if, if you weren't ashamed by it, you wouldn't feel like you had to respond to it. There's a pressure, an external pressure then to either justify yourself or explain it away. But it always elicits a comment in order to save face. I have to be able to get ahead of this. It wasn't planned, so I can't just let it lie. Now, most of the hot mic moments are not safe for preaching, so I, can, <laughs> I, was, I was looking some up to see if I could use a specific example, but most of them are just dropping F-bombs uh, when the mic's on, so I can't, I can't do that. But suffice it to say that when they, those moments elicit a response, we kind of see that shame is something that we still have today. Uh, once you cut away uh, all those other um, uh, performances uh, that are oftentimes related with it. And so there's this, I'm, I'm caught in these words that I've said. More than that, though, Thomas, I think, would have been shamed by how little faith he had in Jesus at that moment. We often hear about doubting Thomas, but really Thomas was not much of a doubter. This is his moment of doubting, but, but other than that, uh, it is not, he is not a doubting kind of person. Earlier in John's gospel, when Jesus went to raise Lazarus, the disciples thought that, that Jesus was absolutely crazy to go closer to Jerusalem because everyone was trying to kill Jesus, and he was going basically into the backyard of Jerusalem. But Thomas, he had a different opinion. He said to his fellow uh, disciples, let us, go, let us also go that we may die with him. As one commentator explains, Thomas is certain that to go to Judea means death for them all. 
but not following Jesus obviously did not occur to him as an option. He is a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ unto death. In that moment when he says, yeah, I'm with you. I'll go to see Lazarus. But now that Thomas is face to face with the Lord, that he can't believe is raised from the dead, it would have been to his shame that all of his faithfulness that he had while Jesus was, was alive and, and walking around in his earthly ministry, he somehow lost at the crucifixion. And he would have felt shame. Levels of shame. The question is, what does he do with it? Because everyone feels shame. What do you do with it? Do you laugh it away? Do you just push it down? It doesn't exist. I don't have to deal with this. Or do you do what Thomas does? You own it. And you respond exactly how you're supposed to respond when you have an occurrent feeling of shame. You swiftly correct your unbelief. And you make the clearest confession of faith that can be made. My Lord and my God. What does Thomas do with this shame? He glorifies God with it. That's what he does. He knows there's a place that he can go with his shame because the very marks that are in Jesus testify to the fact that his shame has been covered by someone. And that then is, is a source of great uh, empowerment to him. Again, not that he would consciously been able to, to reason this out in the moment, but that then he can, rather than turn away, fully embrace the one whom he had just denied with the greatest confession, my Lord and my God. Now, literarily, my Lord and my God is, is really a climax in John's gospel. I put some thoughts in the reflection on that because this is the moment where what is said in the prologue, where we know that Jesus is God, is now declared by someone within the, the gospel narrative. And that makes it an amazing moment. What Thomas says is truly remarkable. Uh, and so we need, to re we need to give him credit that what he did was exactly the thing that we must do when we're caught in our disbelief and we feel the shame of that, not to turn away, but to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Now, as Jesus here in his second appearance confronts Thomas in his, um, in his disbelief, provides an opportunity for Thomas to make up for the misblessing, and he does. The one who had put too much weight on his own ability to find the truth on his own now confesses on account of his, in, of his encounter with the truth, capital T, the most important truth in the history of the world is then presented to us that Jesus is Lord. He is for Thomas and he ought to be for us, my Lord and my God. And with that, we can move to our final point, which is how Thomas's individual experience now is magnified, that, it, that his blessing is missed, it's made up for, and now it's magnified in light of his individual experience uh, as now the testimony, the gospel, the good news that we have seen the Lord uh, is to spread to the ends of the earth. The blessing in verses 29 to 31, the blessing is magnified. Look at verse 29. Jesus responds to him. Uh, and I... It doesn't have to be a question. It could be a statement. It could be, you have believed because you have seen me. And blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Uh, if you make it a question, it sounds like an even bigger rebuke of Thomas. Uh, but he does the right thing by repenting and, and confessing Jesus. So, so while it is a rebuke of him to a degree, it certainly is, uh, it's also... Uh, saying, yes, and, like, yes, you, yes, this happened. Uh, but then even more so, blessed are those 
who have not seen and yet have believed. His, this rebuke quickly turns from Thomas uh, to what are we going to do now in light of what Thomas has said. And one commentator is, has pointed out, and this is just one, one additional example of irony within John's gospel, uh, that Thomas was the one who had the opportunity to be the blessed man, right? Blessed is the one who has not seen and believed. Thomas was the guy. He wasn't there the first time. And now Thomas was going to be one of those people who had to go out to the ends of the earth and declare to other people, as an eyewitness, trust me, I've seen the Lord. And believe, knowing that he himself hadn't found that sufficient. Some irony there probably would have stoked a bit of a fire in his evangelistic efforts also, wouldn't it? And interestingly, we now move on to where we are today. We move from these uh, resurrection appearances uh, to receiving and relying all the more so on the eyewitness testimony that the Lord is risen. And this is where this text really comes home as an application for us. For while Thomas had the opportunity to see the Lord, we know that in the 40 days-ish from here, he was going to ascend to heaven, and he would not be seen. For he would be taking his place at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And then the question is, well, if if he goes to heaven, then how is anyone going to believe? And it's the eyewitness testimony then that becomes the way that we see Jesus. We receive the testimony, the good news that Jesus is risen. And that is a blessing. The gospel testimony itself, and this is where I think that John adds his, like, uh, his, his provisional conclusion in verses 30 and 31, right here. He's trying to, to drive home the point to us that it is a real blessing to have the eyewitness testimony, which this is, this entire thing is, but also in particular John's gospel is. This tells us we have seen the Lord, and then we take it. And we believe it, and it is a blessing to us who have not seen the Lord and yet have believed. This simple eyewitness testimony. John tells us in verse 30 that there were other things he could have written, but the point was that he wants you to see the Lord, as it were, through the eye of faith, based on what he has written. And so as things climax here with declaring that Jesus is is my Lord and my God, we see the point of John's gospel then is to be that which uh, we receive in order to be blessed. For it all points to the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and the significance of what uh, what he has done, which is uh, to offer to us life in his name. Now, this language of, of blessedness, that's, that's proverbial language in the Bible. Uh, this is the language of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who, who walks not in the way of sinners, and so on and so forth. This is the language of the Proverbs that sets before us two ways, uh, two paths. One is a path of life, the other is a path of death. The, blessed, the blessedness that is set before us then, uh, in light of what the rest of the Bible says in all these pages that come before, is to remind us that this is a life or death matter that is being presented to us as the gospel, this blessing of the gospel itself is proclaimed. Have we received it or not? The implication in this, the, the, the wisdom uh, genre as it is, is that to put our faith in Jesus is a choice for life, and to reject the testimony is a choice for death. 
And these choices then are laid out uh, for us at this very moment today, as well as for all those then who hear the eyewitness testimony that Jesus is Lord. All of evangelism is serious because it is a choice for life or death. And that's the significance here uh, of what's going on. Are there multiple opportunities? Of course there are, because Thomas had one. He had multiple chances in his life, right? He rejected the first one. He had the second option. Uh, now Jesus is uh, ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father. The gospel continues to go forth in waves. The question is, each time, will you choose life? Will you choose death? And that is how we should think about the blessedness here, that there is, and, and think about it positively here, that the blessed life is believing in Jesus. What does it mean to have a blessed day? It means that Jesus is the anchor for your soul. That you recognize that he is the founder and the perfecter of your faith. That he is the one who is keeping that imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance for you in heaven until he comes again or you go to meet him. The blessed life is life in Christ. And it is a life of faith. For faith is the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. Not seen. So as we think about the blessedness that is magnified here, it is magnified uh, not in, the, in its quality. For the life that is offered to Thomas and to those who heard Thomas a day after this Sunday, you know, on Monday morning, when then he went out uh, to share this blessing, it's the same blessing. It's the same one in magnitude with, you know, the, the whole redemptive historical things about Pentecost hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. But, you know, all those things considered, it's the same, it's the same blessedness. But it's the magnification of it that it will go to the ends of the earth. And since this is coming on the heels of the, the, the kind of great commission that we saw last week, we recognize that this is what Jesus wants us to do, is now to proclaim that blessedness to the ends of the earth, to offer a choice for life over the choice of death, to be wise unto salvation, and not through our own reasoning, and not through trying to figure it all out in this world, but by faith receiving the testimony, the eyewitness testimony, that Jesus is our Lord and our God. Declaring the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as the blessedness that is offered up to those who will believe. The resurrection stands at the center of redemption. It is, in fact, key to receiving the greatness of God's heart in his salvation that he offers up to us rather than the terrible justice of his wrath. In some respects, that's why we need to present the gospel as a choice for life over death. Of course, those aren't balanced. We should, we should emphasize the life. We don't just say, if you want to die, fine. It's not how God treats the world. But we treat it in, this, in the realm of this wisdom uh, idea that blessedness is life and it is life in communion with God. Finally, th just one more point of, uh, for takeaway here is this magnifies. We could talk about it qualitatively within ourselves, maybe. Uh, letting this, this blessedness magnify within us, this life, uh, receiving the, the fullness and the richness over time by marinating in the truth that Jesus is our Lord and our God. 
means less and less becoming functionally uh, uh, or accidental anti-supernaturalists, denying that there's only that which my eyes can see, my ears can hear, my hands can touch, right? And further and, and, and even more so embracing the fact uh, that God has broken through in time, and though we do not see it, that he is working. So how does this practically work out? It means that we don't functionally deny uh, that God can help us in our sin struggles. You can accidentally become an anti-supernaturalist uh, when you apply this blessed life uh, to your sanctification, and you think that you're the only one working on your sanctification. You're not. And blessed is the one who does not see this, does not see God somehow manipulating us, but still believes that God is, in fact, dealing with each and every one of us and growing us into Christ's likeness. Maybe we can see this also just, uh, you know, corporately speaking, when we think about how it looks like the church is doing, is, is just in a terrible state? And is God really at work? We know he is. And we shouldn't just turn into accidental anti-supernaturalists like Thomas here and deny that even though I can't see with my eye or perceive with my own powers of judgment that God is at work, that must mean that God is is not at work. As if I can't see numerical growth then I'll never believe that God is at work in this world or in this community or in this particular congregation or in my own life. Rather, and if we feel that way, and in those moments of weakness, uh, we should feel ashamed uh, that we have discounted so tremendously the power and the authority that Christ has and the promise that he will be with his church to the end of the age and then he's actually and in fact still working in you, in the church, in this community, and in the world to bring about his glorious purposes. And what do we do? We do what Thomas does. Uh, we double down on our confession that Jesus is Lord and God. We turn to him, trust in him, and seek for him to continue to work to the praise of his glorious grace. And we know he will because he has promised it, and we believe his promises. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your word, and we thank you uh, that it is a testimony uh, that Jesus is Lord. He is your son. Uh, He is the Savior of the world. Uh, Would we, uh, in our uh, disbelief, uh, be uh, turned to a fuller and a deeper belief? Uh, Would we recognize the blessing that it is uh, to believe? Uh, Would we know uh, its life-giving consequences, uh, and would we uh, revel in them, uh, giving all glory uh, to Christ our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of preparation, hymn 423, according to thy gracious word.
Please be seated. As we come to this uh, table, we do not see the exalted Lord Jesus as he is today. What we see, however, is his abundant uh, grace and his provision to us uh, that uh, he does provide for us not only his word spoken, but his word seen in this sacrament uh, to strengthen us, to strengthen us in the memory of who he is and what he has done and how that then impacts our entire life for it is a blessing for us. And when we remember that remembering as a biblical concept is not just what does my head recall, uh, but is very much a, a whole bodily engagement, a whole self engagement, uh, then we know that uh, here we are strengthened because we eat and we remember because he has told us to. And by faith then, as we appropriate his promises and, and do his commands, he will provide not just for our minds, but for our whole selves, what we need then uh, to be faithful and to fully experience that blessed life uh, that he has promised to us. This uh, table is for uh, those who have uh, placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, been baptized into his church, and admitted to this table by the elders of their respective congregation. If that is you, then freely come. Remember the Lord uh, in, in all of yourself, in the fullness of who you are. Uh, rely on him. Strengthen in your faith, and if you are doubting, then ask him to strengthen your faith. If this is not described who you are, if you are a child who has not publicly professed your faith, if you are an adult who has not uh, been um, baptized into Christ's uh, church and admitted to this table, then let these elements pass you by. Uh, but ask me or one of the other elders about the gospel uh, that you might know uh, the one who has revealed himself as life for us. We do use wine in the celebration of the Lord's Supper for reasons of diet or conscience. You prefer juice, you can find it in the outer ring. And if you require gluten-free bread, you'll find it in small bags in the bread trays. If you have any questions, please ask the elders as they distribute. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, that we can come to this uh, table and that you provide uh, the richness of your grace uh, to us. And pray that we would eat uh, by faith and that we would be strengthened uh, by Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it 
He gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we give you all praise and thanks. We thank you you that we have this opportunity uh, to eat this bread and drink this cup. We thank you uh, that we have the privilege uh, to uh, join with Christ, uh, to be joined to Christ, that we have the right to be children of God because we have been born of you through his work. I pray, Father, that uh, you would uh, strengthen us uh, in Uh, our assurance uh, of the blessed life it is uh, to have faith in in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 11, Now Blessed Be the Lord Our God. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
please be seated. Let me highlight a couple announcements some, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, bulletin. Um, although I just thought I had the date for, for some of them, and I don't, so <laughs> I might need some help with that. Uh, as I go, we'll, we'll crowdsource these announcements. Uh, but first of all, the uh, men's reading group uh, uh, meets this Wednesday as we continue to work through uh, Glenn Scrivener's book, uh, The Air We Breathe. So uh, we will uh, join on Zoom at 9 p.m. for that. Uh, mark your calendars for uh, spring cleanup day on Saturday, May 4th, uh, where uh, we will uh, do some work around and inside the church to, to try to help uh, keep things uh, in proper order. And um, so there's that. And then the men's uh, fellowship night. I didn't. Are you looking it up? I know. <laughs> what, what day is it? Yeah, sorry about that. But the, it was in the newsletter. What's that? The hymn sing is the 23rd. So we haven't had a hymn sing in a while. Uh, but on June 23rd, uh, we are going to uh, have a hymn sing uh, to, uh, to kind of restart uh, what we used to do pretty regularly in the evenings uh, here at the Church of Potluck, an opportunity to uh, gather and to uh, sing praises to our God and to joy fellowship together. Uh, the men's fellowship 17th. is May 17th, so Friday, May 17th. Uh, so we're beginning to uh, have more uh, opportunities uh, for fellowship together, uh, please uh, uh, think about how you can uh, you know, increase your participation in the life of the church uh, as we can all seek to glorify God in it. Uh, those are all of my announcements. T yes, Tom. I just want to point out Tom Herman is the uh, champion of okay. March it's not because It's not because it's John that I haven't mentioned it yet. Oh. <laughs> all right. I was waiting... Until we had the, the grand unveiling of the trophy before I announced John as the winner of March Madness. But John did win, so congratulations. Yeah. As is often the case at Tricky Fields, and you navigated it well, so well done. Well done. Now, those are all my announcements. You are dismissed.